Well, for our next speaker, we're very proud to introduce a young global leader, a visionary strategist, and a great adventurer uh, with an amazing resume. He's a brilliant speaker, and he will address how the evolution of megacity and human activity are shaping the world and impacting civilization through an emerging global connectivity. Known for his refreshing and optimistic vision towards international issues and a sense of adventure that knows few bounds, I would like, ladies and gentlemen, to call on stage Parag Khanna. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm absolutely honored to be here. I'm thrilled to uh, not be the opening speaker because we've already had such inspiring uh, comments and remarks. And I want to reflect for just a moment on something that Guido said at the beginning. He said, you are all here designing for the future. I believe you're doing something much more profound than that. You are designing the future itself, not just for the future. And you're designing the future by building it. And so I want to begin today by discussing with you how all of your work in designing the future is leading to a complete reorganization of human civilization. The old models of organizing humanity according to states and boundaries are giving way to a new model in which the world, in which our society is designed and governed through the force of connectivity. And that is so visible if you change the maps that you look at. We are so accustomed to looking at the wall and seeing the world divided according to boundaries only. But we are doing so much more as we build a new world order. Just look, for example, at all of the world's infrastructural networks. This is a map of just the world's transportation systems, all of the highways and railways, for example, that allow people to move ever more seamlessly across the continents, airports as well. Then there's our energy systems, all of the world's uh, electricity grids, oil and gas pipelines can be shown on a map. Then, of course, there are communications networks, all of the world's submarine internet cables. And this is just the beginning, more and more and more infrastructures that are uniting us together into one collective civilization. I view this as a revolution in global connectivity. Connectivity is not just the most powerful force in history, it is the most powerful force of the future as well. And you can see it as we invest more and more in all of these infrastructural networks. If you plot it over time, especially just the last 100 years, what you see unfolding before your eyes is our ability to use our engineering and technology to wrap the world in an exoskeleton, a matrix of infrastructures that allow us to rethink how we organize ourselves, how we interact with each other, how our economies operate, even how our politics and society changes. All of it happens as a result of this connectivity. And so what I like to do is to produce maps that show us this connectivity, that privilege, if you will, all of the connectivity. We think of our maps as being static and two-dimensional, but here you're looking at the three-dimensional domain of connectivity and the shifting experience within that connected world. And so you can go online and look at various mapping tools that I and others have developed that show you how you can move around the world and navigate and zoom in and out and look at all of the world's major infrastructures. It's not just a simple X-ray, it's an MRI of our unfolding technological civilization. And to me, this represents such a fundamental evolution in how we look at the world. We don't disagree about natural geography. We know we inhibit the same planet. We know that on our maps, brown represents the deserts, green represents the forests, blue represents the oceans. Now, as I said before, we're all accustomed to looking at static political geography maps. What do those maps show us? They show us how we're divided from each other, and that's it. But that is not the reality of the world today. Most of what governs our lives, most of what dictates our interactions is not how we're divided from each other, but how we're connected to each other. And so only if you look at all three of these layers together, the natural geography, the political geography, and the functional geography, will you appreciate First, how complex the world is, how many feedback loops there are occurring across these different layers, but also you'll discover 
all of the opportunities because you'll see who is connected to where and to what and how. And that is the evolution of our cartography. And it is going to unfold faster and faster and faster. Why? Because we are investing trillions of dollars per year in these categories of infrastructure, all of which promote connectivity, whether it is transportation, whether it is energy, whether it is communications, whether it is cities, all of that investment. Now, I think it's brilliant for Dassault to be diversifying its business uh, so widely because if you look at this chart, what you see is that the annual investment that the governments of the world make in defense and so forth is actually remaining relatively static. But the global investment in infrastructure is skyrocketing. Why? Well, because the world's population has tripled since the end of the Second World War. Tripled. The number of countries in the world has also tripled. But where has been the corresponding investment in these basic infrastructures for a world of 8 billion people? We have only begun to make it. So today, if we're at a level of about $4 trillion per year in infrastructure, we need to double that. And that's finally starting to happen. The number one priority in the G20, the IMF, the World Bank, all the governments of the world, whether it's the US government or in Asia, is to increase infrastructure investment, to create opportunities for jobs, to, to uh, accelerate urbanization, to get people more connected to opportunity. And that is only going to happen if we continue in this path of investing in that connectivity. Europe leads the way. Here we are in the heart of Europe, and Europe maybe has taken for granted the fact that it is already the world's infrastructural leader, the highest quality, the highest rate of fixed capital formation in the world is generally in European countries. So much so that Europe is, again, the map of Europe is better understood through functional geography than political geography. Sure, there are debates right now about Brexit, and some, country, some other countries may want to uh, uh, come out of the Eurozone. Maybe there is uh, individual countries that want to pull out of the Schengen Agreement. But that is not the big picture. That's happening on the fringes. The big story, if you look at fundamental areas like currency, because I don't believe that the Euro is an egg that can be unscrambled, or if you look at energy, here is a map of the European oil and gas grid. You can see how completely integrated European countries are. Do you remember the Fukushima nuclear disaster that uh, tragically struck Japan in 2011? After that, the German government said that they would try to go non-nuclear, that they would phase out nuclear power. But of course, they can't really do that because they import nuclear power from France, right? You cannot untangle European countries as easily as simply what you do with the borders and with laws. The utilities are fused together. Some parts of the region, some parts of Europe, such as the Baltic region, are already so well advanced that even their governments share service with each other. Their telecoms are increasingly integrated. Their banks are integrated. That is a model not just for the rest of Europe, but for the rest of the world. And it is going to reshape not only relations uh, that as Europe expands uh, eastward, as it has for the last 25 years, it's also happening on the other side of the world if you look at China in the Far East. For the last 25 years, China has massively increased its infrastructure investment too. While Europe has been building from west to east, China has been improving its infrastructure to prepare to expand from east to west. Look at now the volume of, Europe's, uh, of, of China's high-speed rail networks. It's almost equivalent to that of Europe, as well as paved roads. And that has had such enormous benefits. The benefits of infrastructure, again, in Europe we take it for granted. Just think about what it has done in a country like China with a population of over one billion people. It has allowed the, uh, the eastern populated areas to better access the western regions of the country that represent two-thirds of its geography. It has uh, allowed, as labor costs rise, it's allowed manufacturing to remain in the country in lower cost areas, in second tier and third tier cities. The accelerated urbanization has created enormous job opportunities. And even in times of economic crisis, such as what happened in 2008, 2009, when so many Chinese people lost their jobs in southern China, they were able to get on a high speed rail, buy a, a cheap ticket, and travel inward, find new jobs, and recirculate around the country. 
All of that because this, these transportation networks are affordable. And now we're seeing the benefit that it has on social mobility, people from the poorest parts of society elevating their incomes as they move around, and even in new growth areas. Look at Alibaba, China's e-commerce giant. Could you imagine making a promise to deliver any product within 48 hours anywhere in such a large country without such a solid logistics and infrastructure network? Could you have an Alibaba in India, given how far behind its infrastructure is? You couldn't. And so the, tech, the communications infrastructure is a layer on top of all of the other basic traditional infrastructures. They work in tandem to elevate entire countries. Now, the biggest story of the next 25 years. I just gave you a short recap of the last 25 years. Again, Europe expanding west to east, China uh, domestically consolidating, and now in the next 25 years, by far the biggest geopolitical and by far the biggest geoeconomic story on Earth in the next 25 years is visible on this one map. This one map actually doesn't show you Western Europe where we are now, but it does show you more than 50%, almost two thirds of the world's population lives right here, right here. And what's happening in the next 25 years is through the process of what the Chinese call the one belt, one road, I call the new silk roads, and they're institutions that are helping to finance these connective infrastructures across Eurasia, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, of which Italy is a member, 80 countries are members. In the next 25 years, Europe and Asia are going to grow together into a seamlessly integrated commercial region. Now remember that up until today, the most dense trade relationship in the world has been, been between the United States and the uh, European Union, more than $1 trillion a year. But in fact, Europe already today has more than $1 trillion of trade with Asia, meaning trade with China, trade with India, trade with Japan, South Korea, Australia. If you add that up, that's more than $1 trillion. And yet, whereas Europe and America have free trade agreements, Europe and Asia have almost no free trade agreements yet. So there has been a big obstacle to having even more trade. And the second big obstacle is that many of the lines that I've drawn onto this map, a lot of the highways, the railways, the oil and gas pipelines, the electricity grids, the ultra, ultra high voltage DC cables, the fiber optic networks, the airports, a lot of that hasn't even been built yet. There is so much friction still in moving goods and sur across the world's largest landmass. In the next 25 years, those frictions will decrease. Europe's trade relations, trade and goods, goods and services across this landmass that you share, you don't think of Asia as being on the same continent as yourselves. In school, everyone is taught that the continents of the world are Europe, Asia, North America, South America. Europe and Asia are not different continents. It is the same geological landmass. You don't think that they're the same geography, but in the next 25 years, we will. Because of what? The power of connectivity is going to bring it together. And the trade volumes, when you think about your future economy, the trade volume is not just going to be one trillion, it's going to be two trillion, three trillion, by far the largest economic zone on the planet Earth. And you are at the western end of it, and right here is the eastern end of it. And it is incumbent on all of you to participate in this process, to accelerate this process for your own economic benefit. What else is happening in this world of connectivity? Well, the anchors of this global system are, again, not just nation states. Throughout most of history, human society has actually been centered on the city. We have had cities for 7,000 years. And over the last 7,000 years, empires have risen and fallen. Nations and states and boundaries, they come and they go. But we always have the city. And now, as you know, most of the world's population lives in cities that will be 70% perhaps by the year 2030. This is the most accurate map, if you will, of humanity. Never mind those maps in your office that just show you the borders. Every person in this room, every one of the eight billion people on Earth is a pixel. 
on this map. So here you can see where we are. You want to design for the future, you want to design the future, you want to design for the age of experience, design where the people are. And the people are in cities, they're primarily in Asia, they're primarily living in coastal cities, and those cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So what I've done is to draw these ovals over the mega city clusters. And those show you not only that the populations of cities in Asia can be three, four, or five times larger than the largest cities in the West. What are the largest cities in America and Europe? Los Angeles and New York, London and Moscow. Populations ranging from 10 to 15 million people. The mega cities of Asia, the broader metropolitan regions, have populations anywhere from 30, 40, up to 80 million people. Tokyo is still the largest city in the entire world, and the Tokyo to Osaka corridor has over 80 million people, most of Japan's GDP. And everywhere you look around the world, you can see that these cities dominate entire national economies. You could go so far as to say that countries depend on cities more than cities depend on countries. Because look at how in so many places, whether it is Russia, whether it is the Philippines, Indonesia, countries with hundreds of millions of people, just one city or two represent more than 50% of the GDP of the entire country. Now, this is also a lesson for us that we have to, obviously these are the cities of opportunity. These are the places where it's important to invest. But it also shows you that these countries have a long way to go to extend the benefits of urbanization to all of their people. Because if you take a place like uh, the Philippines with 100 million people, or Indonesia with more than 200 million people, only a tenth of their population is really participating in the robust growth of their capital cities. So much more has to be done in all of the other geographies. And that too is a huge growth opportunity. Look at the picture another way. Look at just the 40 or 50 uh, key demographic and economic urban hubs of the world projected out to the year 2030. This is data from the World Bank, from the United Nations, from others. What are the principal 50 urban hubs? So for all of you, you can look at this map and you can say, this is simple. Am I there or am I not there? Do I have a presence there? Am I doing, a bus doing business there? Am I selling there? Do I have partners there? Am I part of projects there? Then you will know, are you part of the future or are you not part of the future? Because these are the urban hubs where the future of humanity is really coming together. You can see so many interesting places where because of the triumph of infrastructure and connectivity and functional geography over our traditional ways of thinking, you have cities spreading across borders and creating new economic uh, hubs and zones that are creating opportunity across boundaries. I'll talk just about uh, this one here because I, I myself live in Singapore where it's great to hear that you are designing a 3D city. Um, you can already see the benefits that Dassault has brought to the Smart Nation program of Singapore. But let me talk to you about this infrastructural opportunity because economics is about simply put the optimization of land, labor, and capital. Singapore has very little land, and very little labor, but lots of capital. Its neighbors, Malaysia and Indonesia, have a lot more land, a lot more labor, but much less capital. And going back 20, 25 years, they said, how can we overcome the, 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 the boundaries that we have? After all, Singapore is an island. They said, let's cooperate to locate uh, shipbuilding industry on this island of Indonesia, or uh, special economic zones for real estate investment here, and textiles over there, and let's marry our forces together, our strengths, our relative strengths across our political geography. And now what they're starting to do, three countries are starting to master plan their infrastructure together, jointly agree on which bridges to build, new high-speed railways, and so forth. And you'll find that the fastest growing regions of Malaysia and Indonesia are those that are proximate to Singapore. That's not an accident. It's by design. It's by design of infrastructure, by design of connectivity, and by changing the laws and the codes and the practices to take advantage of all of that connectivity. This is happening all over the world, so much so, I believe that cities think so much differently from countries. When you talk to a mayor, when you talk to the business leaders in, in large cities, they don't ever want to see Brexit, as you know. They don't want to see walls going up. They know that they need talent, they need capital, they need to trade, they need to be connected. Cities 
partially define themselves, not just where, by where they are, but where they are connected to. And the more urban the world becomes, the more hopeful I become that there is going to be generally progressive, generally open attitudes about in the, the global economy and the opportunities of the global economy, because that is how people in cities think. That is probably how all of you think. But we're not there yet. There are three kinds of inequality in the world today. And as you know, that is perhaps our biggest political challenge, is inequality, economic inequality, the inequality of opportunity. There is international inequality, the gap between rich countries and poor countries. There is domestic inequality, the gap between those in countries who get to live in the cities where things are working well and everyone else that has still been neglected. And the third kind of inequality is the inequality within the cities themselves. The bigger the cities get, the less homogenous life is, right? The more diverse they are. So when I go to a mega city, when I go to Sao Paulo, Lagos, Nairobi, Cairo, Jakarta, I'm not in one city, and neither are you. You're in six different cities, depending on what part of the city you are in. Some of these mega cities stretch for tens of kilometers. You can spend one day driving just across Jakarta or Sao Paulo, and you won't make it to the other end of the city, right? Because of the traffic, because of the poor infrastructure. So what you also have to design when you're designing the future is designing a better quality of life for all of the residents of the city. And when you do that, you are improving the livelihoods of most of humanity because most of humanity already lives in cities, but most of them don't live in the best part of town, right, if there is such a thing. So that is also part of the 21st century challenge, but it is not just to lament the inequality, it is to observe what a massive opportunity it is. And we know that it is a race against time. We have to do this for many reasons, not just to overcome inequality, but because we know that the more dense and more technologically modern an urban society is, the lower its greenhouse gas emissions become. And that is a collective, that is an existential challenge. We also have to design for that. And we know that the way to get there is through the kinds of technology transfer, the smart systems, the smart buildings, all of the things that you are engaged in. That is the way to overcome climate change. Actually, my background is in studying international diplomacy and conflict. And I know that all of the negotiations, all of the climate agreements, whether it's the one in Paris or Bali or Cancun or Copenhagen, that's just diplomacy. It's not binding. What it doesn't do is to make it affordable and make it, um, and make it possible and smooth for poorer countries that are rapidly industrializing to take on these technologies and to build their urban future around them. Only you can do that. Diplomats can't do that. And there are so many things that we have to do to make our own cities smarter and to make the cities of the developing world smarter. And I think in the next couple of days, you are going to be talking about all of these things, about what a, a city of driverless cars looks like, how to design the mixed use uh, real estate communities that are more pedestrian friendly and more walkable, how to use the internet of things, the internet of experiences, how to allow people to co-create commercial services activity much more smoothly and seamlessly in the urban environment. You will be talking about and showcasing all of those things and all of that contributes to the smarter city of the future, which we can do not just in Milan, not just in Paris, not just in Berlin, but everywhere in the world as the cost of technology goes down. And cities, therefore, become the drivers of innovation, the drivers of innovation that we need. And innovation has traditionally been so centered on a few key Western cities, but what we're starting to see is that innovation is spreading. The cities, the global cities that we know about very well, uh, again, Silicon Valley, London, and so forth, that are, that are, that are key hubs, but now we're seeing progress in, uh, in so many developing world uh, areas, uh, in, in India, for example, in Vietnam and elsewhere. Because I live in Asia, I get to spend so much time traveling around these hubs and seeing how at the small level of incubating innovation, but at the higher level of the mayor's and leader's commitment to new kinds of master plans, there is a consensus around the world in the most populous places that they have to do all of these things. And so it's a huge opportunity for you. In the end, I like to show this uh, map that was created by an artist who was saying, what would the world look like if we had not only all of the cities in the world connected to each other, but through 
uh, sort of hyperloop, a seamless kind of connectivity between uh, the principal cities of the world and use the London tube map to represent it. Uh, this, this is the world that we should not only dream about, it's the world that we should be building. It's the world that you are already designing. And I think this world of connecting cities is going to be a more prosperous world, a more inclusive world, and a more peaceful world. So I wish you much success in the next couple of days as you work together to design that future. Thank you very much. Thank you.